5.46, and it's time to have our first nice mix there, I thought. Well from done, yeah. They were yeah, very good. Into Albinoni's Adagio. People were applauding that <laughs> yeah. in the gallery. <laughs> yeah, they were. Loving that. Uh, anyway, we're also live in the pub. Oh, the trolley. Lovely. There goes the trolley. What are we grabbing from the trolley as we go past there, Suze? Um, I've grabbed a nice dark porter from Cheddar Ales called uh, Totty Pot, which is 4.5%. Excellent for a nice cold day, which is today. So A Totty enjoy. Pot? Totty pots, okay. yeah. Tonight's uh, confession and the first speaker uh, of the week goes to Pegleg. Thank you, Pegleg. Father Simon and the Merchants of Fair and Just Atonement. The incident for which I seek forgiveness. By the way, I guess a little, a little bit PG for uh, injury detail. Okay. The incident for which I seek forgiveness occurred in 2016 under a star-filled night sky 15 miles off the Egyptian coast in the Southern Red Sea. But first, I must take you back to a damp and cloudy day in England, April 1990, to explain the catalyst which facilitated this foul web of deceit and lies. I was a keen motorcyclist back then, and unfortunately on that fateful day, due to poor judgment and a self-belief which far exceeded any talent, I fell off my beloved Yamaha 600. The type of bike is relevant to the story. Other brands available. Yeah. <laughs> my injuries were quite severe. My left leg was badly broken and was left paralyzed and very badly scarred, requiring extensive skin grafts to the upper thigh. And I also lost three fingers from my left hand. It took a while to recover any semblance of normality, as you can imagine. One of the things I managed to achieve with my limited mobility was learning to scuba dive. Wow. Jump forward 26 years and I am now an accomplished diver and headed off to the Southern Red Sea with my brother, also by now an experienced diver, for a live abroad dive safari as the name suggests a live abroad means that you stay aboard a dedicated dive boat rather than a hotel based holiday oh. which enables you to get to remote locations for more exclusive diving experiences premium you could say very good. The Red Sea is renowned as being a unique and spectacular dive tourism destination. And these kind of trips often attracted like-minded divers from all over the world. For example, there was a delightful middle-aged Japanese couple on our particular boat. Because of the remote nature of the dive sites in the Southern Red Sea, you would normally have the reefs to yourself. But on the rare occasion that other boats were in the area, they would often moor alongside each other in the evening and the guests would mingle between boats and share anecdotes from their days diving. On the night in question, we were moored on a reef and just such a boat came alongside us and shared our anchor line. Before the skipper had even time to shut the engines down, the first of the guests from the neighbouring boat hopped onto our deck. He was a mountain of a man, wearing a Confederate flag bandana and a huge oversized T-shirt with a rather unambiguous slogan of Trump now emblazoned uh, across his chest. Okay. Yes, he was an American. He spoke with an unmistakable deep southern states drawl. Oh, right. Well, howdy we... doody, howdy doody, y'all. I sure hope you've gotten some cold beer on this here heap of junk. We ran out of beer two days ago. Hot dog. Yes. He and his friends proceeded to enjoy our, our hospitality and completely emptied our fridge of beer. When our new American friend, let's call him Randy, <laughs> let's. recounted a quite astonishing story of the time he that he had time... He told her an astonishing story at the time he had caught a red snapper. He said, a goddamn shark came out of nowhere and took the whole goddamn fish right out of my hand. <laughs> I saw my brother roll his eyes and he casually said in his most understated British accent possible, wow, that's unbelievable. My brother had a bit of a tiff with a shark once, you know. I shot him a sideways glance. Oh, yeah, what happened? Says Randy with almost dismissive indifference. Oh, oh, yeah, what happened? <laughs> My brother continued, well, there we were, diving on a reef, not too far from here, actually, when one of those little fellas, the shark, swam over and gave him a little nip. Why don't you show him your leg, Mike? Uh, peg leg. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He said to me yeah. with a wry smile. I paused for a moment as the realization of the opportunity to gain a little one-upmanship on our Confederate friends sunk in. All eyes turned to me. Yes, well, like my brother said, it wasn't far from here. I didn't see him coming as he was below me. He got hold of my left thigh, pulled up the leg of my shorts, exposing my scars. All of the guests let out a little gasp of varying degrees, but Randy's was by far the most expressive. God dang, son of a gun. I ain't never seen nothing like that. How in the hell did you get away? I had him hooked, and it was time to reel in the prize catch. 
Well, it's funny you should uh, ask that. I continued with a nonchalant smile. I punched him in the mouth a few times and persuaded the little blighter to loosen his grip, managed to swim away. Lost a few fingers in the process, though, and I raised my left hand, showing only my remaining forefinger and thumb. More gasps from the guests. For what was the first time in the evening, Randy and his friends seemed almost lost for words. What? What, what kind of shark was it? <laughs> well, I can't be certain, I said, but I think it was one of those Yamaha sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese, I think, quite ferocious, you know. Randy's face turned a little grey, and I wondered if he may now be regretting necking quite so much of our beer. Not wishing to spoil the facade from further questions, my brother and I excused ourselves and retired to our bunks. Father Simon, I seek forgiveness not from Randy and his beer-blagging cronies, nor from the other guests who innocently had to endure my gruesome account of this fictitious shark attack, but from the poor middle-aged Japanese couple I mentioned who spent the rest of the evening fastidiously going through their marine wildlife reference books <laughs> searching for the mysterious Yamaha shark, which uh, was, of course, our, uh, our own creation. Thanks, uh, Peg Lake, Mike. And uh, let's... <laughs> I mean, it was well a very done. vivid I mean, no, description. No one I noticed. Think. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think he had it coming to him. Anyway, let's just check in with Sister Susie there. Well, Peg, like, I, I like what you did here because, uh, you know, you went through a really hard time and, you know, you, you kind of fought through all that adversity and to still dive and do all of that, I think, is wonderful. And also, that man sounds really annoying. So he does. I think he deserved it. And um, the name of the shark, just excellent. Uh, well done. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm going to forgive you. So forgiveness from Susie, a brother from another guy. I, I think we were all in uh, Peg Leg's corner there with the obnoxious American and his uh, and his uh, trying to monopolise the conversation. Really, and, and isn't it the case? I mean, I'm not an expert on sharks, but you are supposed to punch them in the nose if they attack you. I mean, how anyone has the presence of mind to want to punch a shark in the nose is beyond me. But uh, that is what you're supposed to do. So, so good advice from Peg Leg. And also, I'm going to forgive just for the accent just for Thank the accent you. that gets through so yes definitely be given well i thought it was uh, pretty glorious as well okay so what we want is the people's verdict on 61054 first word is simon do you forgive peg leg yes or no 61054 first word is simon tonight's confession came from peg leg a story about an overbearing american man who boarded their diving boat and peg leg convinced him that he'd survived the shark attack by showing him various scars and missing fingers from a previous accident. Anyway, it was a very good story. Pegleg does get the smart speaker. Does he get any forgiveness? Let's check in with that. Yes, he does. Everybody is forgiving tonight. Marion in Glasgow says, I've been on many of those trips and boasters deserve all they get. Forgiven, says JJ Nashford. It's likely Randy lied about the shark grabbing the fish right out of his hand, so Pegleg lying is only giving him a taste of his own medicine. And Carol says, I have friends who've suffered motorbike injuries and one of them was also injured in a shark attack. And from what I know of her, I think she'd have your back for sure. If I were Pegleg, I'd use the shark attack version any time it's necessary. Uh, it was a good tale. Thank you, Peg Leg. And uh, if you have a confession, it doesn't have to be a shark confession, a diving <laughs> confession, an American accent confession, but maybe you thought you've got a tale and you fancy the smart speaker, let us know. You send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Uh, so it's confession time. Now, don't forget that if we choose your confession, uh, you do get a smart speaker in return. That's basically... Uh, the deal, that's the, you know, that's the way we decided to run things. Oh, the drinks trolley. <laughs> drinks trolley, always very welcome round about this time. What have you selected from the trolley as it whizzed past? As there? it whizzed past, well, I've taken inspiration from Jess earlier and let's go with a nice large glass of Sauvignon Blanc because oh, I think yeah. that's very nice. That's right, that's what, I think she'd had a couple too many though. Yeah, she? well, yeah. <clears throat> By her own admission. <laughs> Today's confession uh, comes from Tom and Gemma, but mainly Tom, uh, rated PG for injury and nudity. Ooh. Really? Oh no! I, I think. I mean, I think. I think, but I, but it's still upstanding and in, and decent. Oh. Father Simon and his collective bunch. I am seeking forgiveness now. This is Tom speaking here, as it has been years since my last confession. Actually, he was with you back in your other radio oh. days. It started off with my wife having to see a surgeon about the problem she was having with her gallbladder, due to stones in it. Oh. We sat in the room waiting for the surgeon to enter and as she was in a lot of pain i was very anxious about her health so was a bit touchy i guess you could say <laughs> if you've ever seen anyone in pain with gallstones you will know exactly what i mean see 
Antonio Conte for details. <laughs> okay. If anyone would want <laughs> no. more details no. about stones in your gall. Oh, okay. No, thanks. Yeah. Anyway, we waited and then the surgeon entered the room. Sir Jeremy Bufton Tufton. <laughs> of course. The nurse seemed to bow to him as soon as he entered, so he guessed he was someone high up. I stood, I stretched out my arm to greet him with a handshake and a jolly hello. He totally ignored me. Oh. He was, Father Simon, the living embodiment of everything that you've heard about arrogant, aloof, infuriating, oh cocky, call me God consultants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Also snooty, ego driven, arrogant, and vain. And oh. yes, I worked all this out in a matter of seconds. <laughs> He spoke to my wife. He asked her on a scale of one to ten to describe the pain. Her reply made me laugh, actually. <laughs> she said, it flipping hurts, or words to that yeah. effect. Mm -mm. That set the tone for the rest of the consultation. He was a cold fish, Father Simon. He wouldn't know a bedside manner or sense of empathy if it hit him about the head, which is what I wanted to do. Perfunctory and rude, he continued in his imperious display of pompous domineering behavior my blood was boiling now my wife had had robotic surgery a few years before on her kidney so this surgeon wanted to see where the keyhole marks were before he operated on her to decide the best course of action at this point it was suggested she remove some items of clothing resulting in what i believe film film people call upper body nudity okay <laughs> I sat like a told-off schoolboy in the corner of the room. I looked on in silence. Pathetic, I know, but also just not good enough. I knew his sort. I'd met them at school, and I'd had enough. And this is the bit where I'm asking for forgiveness, please. I asked him if I should leave the room. He looked over the top of his glasses and said in an imperious voice, Are you talking about <laughs> Don't, Don't be so ridiculous, you silly man. Bally, bally, <laughs> I looked at my Amazing. wife and then him and I said in a meek and embarrassed manner well all right then and I paused and then I said you do know I'm only her taxi driver mate don't you <laughs> <laughs> well you can cut, cut the air with, with a scalpel <laughs> his jaw dropped open <laughs> speechless the nurse mouth OMG seconds of complete silence and utter horror followed my, because my wife understood my sense of humor she played along yeah he just picked me up uh, I think I'll give him a decent tip what do you think doc he spluttered something under his breath and looked away for me to carry on examining my wife we never let on that I was actually her husband and to this day he has no idea and presumably still thinks that I was her taxi driver ha <laughs> ha uh, anyway please uh, if you could forgive me and my wife for not confessing to Sir Jeremy Bufton Tufton before but he was a stuck-up, sniffy, conceited little toe rag. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Really? Was he really? Really? Yeah. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> and also, Gemma, groveling for forgiveness. Or maybe not. No, I don't think so. Yeah, In this don't, case, don't uh, Sister Susie from the pub. Uh, well, Tom, you really, really didn't like that doctor, did you? Um, but I, I, I feel for you, and I feel for your wife on the pain front as well, because that is not fun. However, I'd like to there was no malice in it it was a bit of fun i love that your wife played along that's yeah. excellent and and you know very quick timing there so i'm i'm in a forgiving mood so i think i'm gonna forgive okay Tom nice and Gemma. nice nice what do you say well uh, i'm obviously gonna forgive and here's here's course. the reason why is the consultant comes in and says on a scale of one to ten how painful is it and is it likely i'm going to say one I wouldn't be, if it didn't matter, if I'm not that, um, not in that much pain, I'm not going to be in this office, am I? So, uh, I'm definitely going to forgive because he is, uh, arrogant and aloof and, and all the other things that you called him. And, uh, yes, definitely forgiven. As soon as Sir Jeremy Bufton Tufton entered, I think Matt had <laughs> yeah, written yeah, down. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Uh, Excellent yeah. accent. Off anyway, it's the, thank you very much. <laughs> it's the people's verdict. That's the one that matters. Uh, anyway, before we continue with Tunes Day, uh, let's get the people's verdict on today's confession, uh, which involved an arrogant consultant and uh, Tom, who was pretending to be a taxi driver. Uh, the people's verdict is in. Yes, yeah, Sarah from Devon says, I agree with Matt. Me and my lovely 10-year-old completely forgive. Genius. Uh, Drew says, forgiven 100%. I had to see a consultant last year. He sent me for an X-ray and wrote down the wrong hand to be X-rayed. Ah. This lot deserve all the mirth and merriment bestowed upon them. Keep up the fine work, Simon, Matt, Susie and team. And finally, Ray says, I had the same situation with the consultant who came into my hospital room after 
after major hand reconstruction to show students his handiwork. He asked if he, I had any questions. I said, will I be able to play the guitar once I'm healed? He said, yes, I don't see why not. I said, that's great, I couldn't play before. Fantastic hey! work! Boom! That's the worst thing. It, when, when, when a consultant comes in and says, do you mind if I bring in the students? To which uh, the answer is always... Probably yes. Probably yes, but I'm going to know no. have to learn. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. So if you've got a top confession uh, for us, we would love to get it. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Uh, there you go. I'm a bonus for Becky in Towersy. Thank you very much. Loving it. Uh, lo- <laughs> loving it. Let's just check in with the... Uh, check in with the drinks trolley. Uh, Sister Susie joins us from the pub. What are we grabbing yes. as it goes past? Uh, we're grabbing a, a nice gin and tonic. I've gone with a one that's called Blue Bottle, which is made on uh, the Guernsey Island, um, and it's still there. And it's very, very tasty. Strong at 47%, though, so wow. you know, maybe just yeah, a single. Warned. Okay. Uh, today, thank you. Today's confession comes from Tim, Father Simon and the Holy Trinity of Forgiveness. By the way, Matt, you're not going to forgive us. Oh, really? My confession oh. dates back to the end of term, 10 years ago, when I was working as a performing arts teacher oh, in right. Sheffield. There you go. See? <laughs> As was usual at this time of year, the staff went on their annual end of term shenanigans, and following the partaking of a, some lemonade, many of them began to move on to nightclubs, the kebab shop, and so on. However, being a man of culture, I suggested to a female colleague, who I quite fancied, that instead of going to a nightclub with the others, we should go to the final late night showing of that year's big film release, Les Miserables, oh, at the local cinema. Oh. Surprisingly, she agreed, and we made our way to the multiplex. As you might be aware, Les Miserables is a long film, and that, together with the late-night showing time, 11.30, I seem to remember, meant that there I was with absolutely no one else in the cinema apart from my colleague and myself. As a performing arts teacher, I've seen Les Mis, the stage musical, on many occasions, and I know the words to the songs inside out. Whilst we were eating popcorn waiting for the film to start, I hit upon the idea of impressing my colleague with both my awesome acting skills and my fabulous singing voice, which, on reflection, (laughs) aren't perhaps as good as I thought they were. The lights went down and the opening song started, which was a rousing number in which a beleaguered-looking Hugh Jackman was dragging a bit of a ship around. Oh, yeah. I immediately leapt out of my chair and in my best tenor voice began marching up and down the aisles, (laughs) singing, Look down, look down, don't look them in the eye. As loudly as I possibly could. My colleague, I'm fairly sure, found this hilarious. I mean, who wouldn't? I am a performing arts teacher. As I grew in confidence, I began acting out the key moments from the film. Is there a hell that is worse than this? Acting out key moments from the film, at the same time as adopting a variety of different comedy voices for each of the characters. I must say I was particularly fond of my Madame Thénardier. Uh, played by Helena Bonham Carter. Master of the house saw me clambering on the seats down near the front and raising my imaginary tankard of ale in triumph whilst the battle scenes demanded several of my finest dramatic screams of anguish as well as various commando rolls and stealth crawls around the floor of the cinema. However, being a true professional, I adopted a more sombre and sensitive demeanour during Fontaine's death scene. Oh, Anne, oh, good of you. Anne Hathaway, of nice. course. Yeah. I was sure my colleague was loving the extra dimension I was bringing to the movie. Towards the end of the film, there's a particularly emotional song which featured a big orchestral build-up followed by a dramatic, silent pause. Before the emotional fade-out at the end, I knew this was coming and I knew in advance what I had to do. As the song began to build, I positioned myself on one of the seats at the front, standing on it in a pose suitable for the hero that I was. I pulled open my shirt buttons, exposing my magnificent chest, and I imagined how great I must have looked, silhouetted against the war-torn projected backdrop of revolutionary France. I adopted my finest Luciano Pavarotti voice, and as the music crescendoed, I raised my arms to the heavens in pure dramatic passion as I waited for the grand finale. At the exact moment of the final dramatic pause in the music, I have to say unfortunately I broke wind loudly (laughs) and decisively it was of such magnitude that I'm sure it would have been heard by the projectionist I was about to take my well deserved bow when I heard a surprisingly angry sounding voice billowing from a darkened corner a few few rows away from me for crying out loud will you (laughs) sit down (laughs) To my horror, I realised there was a couple who'd been sitting there watching the film for the entire time who I had failed to notice. 
Suffice to say, I didn't bother waiting for my standing ovation and quickly grabbed my friend at the end of the film and made a hasty exit stage left. So I need to beg forgiveness, not for my colleague, the projectionist, or even the couple in the cinema, as I'm sure they all thought I was fabulous and mm. added a little bit of je ne sais quoi to the proceedings. Mm. But I seek forgiveness from the two French blokes, Claude Michel Schomburg and Alain Boubille, who composed Les Miserables as my impromptu sound effects may have distracted slightly from their masterpiece and maybe also from Wolverine and Russell Crowe for yeah. stealing their glory. Well, uh, I, as soon as we got to the dramatic arts <laughs> teacher, I knew which way Matt was going to yeah. go, and he hates Les Mis anyway, but let's yep. check in with the voice of sanity, Sister Susie here. Well, Tim, I, do you know what? I, I love a musical, and I kind of was on your side for quite a lot of this. However, I can't think of anything worse if I was going to watch... Uh, a musical in the cinema and there was someone doing that Correct. there are particular performances where you can sing along and you can get involved and they encourage it but if i was there and you were doing it i think i'd just want to watch hugh jackman on the screen really and i think that i'd find you quite annoying so yeah. i don't think i'm gonna forgive you what took that couple so long i know amazing, anyway <laughs> a brother from another gutter i mean yeah, obviously there's a circle of hell where I'd have to watch musicals <laughs> with drama teachers. Oh my goodness, imagine that. Um, and so, yes, normally I would definitely say I'm, I'm not going to forgive on this. However, oh. Les Mis is a musical and therefore, you know, you couldn't make it any worse. We're all going to have to... I'd happily sit through Les Mis if that would be a drama teacher breaking wind. Uh, frankly. So, yeah, forgiven. So because it's a musical. Because it's a musical and you can't make them any worse, forgiven. Okay, the voice of reason there. Yep. Okay, so the, it's the people's verdict, please. Do you forgive Tim? Yes or no? 61054 on the text. First word is Simon. So we had a confession uh, from Tim, the performing arts teacher in Sheffield, who at a late night screening of Les Miserables, thinking he and his uh, lady friend were the only ones there decided to perform the entire thing himself, uh, not realising that there were other people in the dark also that he had a wind problem. So, <laughs> the people's verdict comes in like this. So, Sarah from Devon, not forgiven. No, no, no. Nobody is better than Hugh Jackman. Nobody. And also, Les Mis, in an attempt to woo someone, she should have run for the hills. Uh, forgiven, says Tim from Sutton, even just to agree with Matt's opinions on musicals. Uh, Johnny imbued. I'm with Matt on this one. I've never really liked musicals. Musicals. The whole bursting into song at a moment's notice is just bizarre. Sounds like the drama teacher improved the mu movie, frankly. And Simon in Bristol says, not forgiven, not for the performance or the breaking wind, but for the fact that I worked at the cinema for five years and there's nothing worse than people who come to the late night viewing as it means the poor staff have to stay at the cinema late when it's dark and creepy. <laughs> nothing is more sinister than an empty cinema at okay, night. OK, very good. OK, thank you, Tim. You get the smart speaker if you have a confession maybe to do with musicals, performing arts, singing, or maybe anything you fancy. If we like your confession and we read it out, you get a smart speaker. Send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. That doesn't mean you're going to go, oh, well, I'm not bothered then. If they're not going to mention me. <laughs> uh, anyway, but you're very welcome, and this is another confession courtesy of Greatest Hits Radio, plus also the David Jacobs Memorial there Drinks Trolley rumbles <laughs> past as it does... Every time, as broadcasting tradition dictates, uh, Sue Lo... Uh, Sue. <laughs> Sue? <laughs> I was thinking of the news. <laughs> yes. Susie, from the pub, has just selected what from the trolley? Um, I've selected a pale ale from a brewery called Daya called Steady Rolling Man. Let me guess, they're near Bristol. Uh, they're not, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Shows what I know. See you. But it's just a very good <laughs> pub and a very <laughs> good beer. It's a very good beer, yeah. Recommend if you spot it, you should try it, because it's very tasty. Tonight's tale comes from Cindy. Thanks, Cindy. I appeal today to the confessional collective to forgive my actions. My story goes back to 1964. When I was 13 years old, my sister was 15. Wow. We lived in the north of Glasgow. My school was in the south. In fact, I went to the same school as Ken Bruce. Oh. You may know him. I hear he is going somewhere yeah. on the 3rd of April. 3rd of April. I actually went to St Custard's Girls' School, uh, whereas right, Ken went to St Custard's Boys' yeah. School. Yeah. However, <laughs> I digress. I just mentioned it because it's got Ken in it. Yes. That's how you get selected. Ken Bruce Confessions, there's an interesting <laughs> thought. Anyway. <laughs> My sister is deaf, says Cindy, so she went to Porridge Court School for the deaf. 
So we both had to take a bus into town and then have a bit of a walk before uh, we each took another different bus to our respective schools. Occasionally, timetables permitting, we would meet at Cathedral Street in town on the way back from school, then get the next bus together for the last leg of the journey. Being back in the 60s, there wasn't much fun around. There were no mobile phones, no tracking systems, which could inform us of the impending arrival of our bus. Having spent many days in the dreary Glasgow cold waiting at a bus stop, we devised a pastime. Actually, I think it was my sister's idea, to be honest, passing the buck already. <laughs> we bought a reel of what was called invisible thread. I don't know if it exists today, but back then it was a thin, clear plastic thread. Now, can I just say at this point that uh, I suppose there's a PG element oh, to really? this because you shouldn't try any of the following. Okay, bombing. understood. Don't copy it. No. My sister and I would stand at either edge of the pavement, her at the wall side <laughs> and me at the gutter side. <laughs> oh, me dear. in my posh school uniform, my sister in her civvies. It didn't look like we were together. Sometimes we were in Cathedral Street and sometimes just around the corner where there was a bus station. We would stretch out the invisible thread across the pavement between us and wait for the next unsuspecting pedestrian to walk into it. Generally, the thread crossed the lower abdomen of the, shall we call them, hit, because that's what we thought of them as, our hits. And after a bit of pressure, the thread would break, leaving the hit fully aware that he or she had walked into something but wasn't quite sure ah. what because they mm. couldn't see anything. Maybe it was a spirit presence. No. My sister and I <laughs> would, of course, be giggling hysterically. It was all a bit like something you would see on Candid Camera. Yes. Ask your grandparents. Mm. Old yes. television. On one occasion, a bus conductress, remember this is the 60s, says Cindy, came from the bus station heading towards the shops. She stopped dead in front of us. She had clearly been watching our antics. So I said, it's okay, there's nothing here, and she just smiled. I suspected that she enjoyed watching the unsuspecting pedestrians as much as we did. But that is not why I'm asking forgiveness. I asked forgiveness for the little old lady of about four oh, foot six, no. Oh, no. carrying her little shopping bag, shuffling her tiny size three feet along the pavement. My sister and I were poised, the thread stretching across the pavement. The little lady got to the thread, but it didn't snap. The thread was so strong and she was so feeble, it stopped the old lady in her tracks. We could see the indentation the thread was making across her tummy, but it didn't break. She was looking all around, wondering what invisible force was stopping her continuing. Was it an angel or a ghost? Or maybe a divine warning to turn back. <laughs> no, yes. My sister and I looked no, no. at each other in shock and I quickly dropped my end of the thread and the old lady started to move again. But she turned around and went back the other way because some dark force had been steering her. The hand of fate maybe had intervened and said, Halt! Turn again, feeble woman. Reconsider your life choices. And she did. I've often wondered if she told her family and friends about the day she was stopped on Cathedral Street by some amazing invisible force of mm. nature. So, I ask forgiveness for this game which I played with my sister, but I'm sure she actually devised it, and it was she that brought yeah, that yeah. little old yeah, lady yeah. to a halt. Thanking you all in anticipation. Uh, kind regards, and that's from Cindy. Well, it's a, it's a prank that you play in the, street, in the street. Back in the 60s, there was nothing else to do in 1964. That's true, yeah. Um, but obviously, uh, pranks with invisible... Th I'm just playing the role of Sister Susie here. Yeah. <laughs> Not to be uh, encouraged. Obviously. But Sister Susie, what do you say here? Well, Cindy, I feel like, you know, the, the, the old lady wasn't hurt, so that was a good thing, but that was lucky because someone could have been hurt. What if they'd have fallen over, broken a leg? You just don't know what's going to happen, do you? And I just think it might have been a bit of fun and a bit silly, and I know that you were just children. However, you seem to pass the buck onto your sister, and I don't think either of you That's should true. have done it in the first place. So therefore, I'm not going to forgive you. A brother from another gutter. Well, you know, I mean, if they'd been using this invisible thread and they'd been using it to trip people up, then I would be minded not to forgive you, because when I go marching through the streets, and woe betide anyone who gets in my and way, you do walk I, fast. I do walk fast, <laughs> I wouldn't be happy about a thread uh, tripping me up, but they weren't doing that, they were they were doing it so that everyone had this uh, spiritual presence, mm. and uh, what how, is this how, how, how fitting that Turn there would again. be a uh, divine oh. intervention on Cathedral Street as well, spotted mm. that, very good. And so for that reason, of all of the lines in the galaxy, 
Murphy all coming together. Yes. I'm going to forgive. Uh, do you forgive, Cindy? It's the People's Verdict, please. Uh, 61054, you'll start your message with Simon. Uh, it's a foodie Thursday on the way. But before we get to there, do you forgive Cindy and her sister? 61054, first word is Simon. Uh, tonight's confession came from Cindy and involved uh, her sister, some invisible thread, a little old lady, and the hand of fate, and some dark forces. Anyway, the people's verdict, here it comes. So Jane in Shropshire says, Forgiven, I relate to this confession. The 60s were a very boring time to grow up in. The invisible thread was just a fantastic invention. I remember tripping my brother up on it all the time. Time. Do that at home. Johnny in Chiswick says, not forgiven, the poor little old lady. I'm just glad she didn't fall over. <laughs> Tricking people in the street is never good. But Ian from Slough says, forgiven, they, they may have stopped her from having an accident later on down the road. It could have been fate. It wasn't. It, why? Uh, oh, OK, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I will, will accept that. Uh, Cindy, not your real name, thank you very much indeed for your confession. And if you have one, uh, if you have a... A tale for us. If we use it, you get a smart speaker. That's the deal. Send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk.